Hello, everybody, and welcome back. Today, we are talking a little bit more in depth about recycling and plastic. Before we dive into all of this, if you haven't had the chance to listen to the previous episode where we talked about some of the myths and facts about recycling, I encourage you to go and check that out as some of the information in that episode I'm going to make some reference to. So this caller calls in to ask some more about the the myth of recycling. So let's check out that call. Hey, Ryan. My question is, is recycling a myth? I had a conversation with a friend the other day, and he mentioned that the idea of recycling and putting, you know, plastic bottles and, you know, cans inside of the recycling bin and hauling it off to the street is a like a cool idea, but it doesn't really uh, contribute to a sustainable future. So I looked into it a little bit, and I read in an article, uh, I forget where the article was from, I think it was the Boston Globe, where there was a a finding with Greenpeace that said that no plastic product meets a common industry back standard for recyclability. So is recycling a myth and is there anything I can do as a regular citizen to contribute to a more sustainable future? Thanks for all you do. So first things first, thank you so much for calling in. I'm like genuinely so stoked to kind of dive into this like more specifically Uh, regarding recycling, the myth of recycling as it pertains to plastics. So the first thing, the best way for me to wrap my head around recycling, it's the best to think about it as there's recycling, and that is your aluminum, your cardboard, your paper, your glass, and then there's plastic. And Oftentimes, the conversation specifically pertaining to plastic bleeds over into recycling as a whole. And as we've kind of talked about in the other episode regarding recycling, the recycling rates for many of the other materials is tremendously high and can't really kind of be lumped into this like mythos that recycling is is fake because recycling for those products is very very real very very real and in many cases is uh, infinitely recyclable as with glass and with aluminum and paper can go through many life cycles before it ends up in the situation of like being able to be diverted to composting rather than landfills. So the first that's the first thing that I just kind of want to state is that we're specifically talking about plastic recycling now. So uh, the thing that makes me excited to talk about plastic is that it is super confusing. And, um, you know, I think as more and more people are encountering these Greenpeace articles and articles similar to it that are uncovering a lot of uh, information about stuff that has happened uh, historically in the past and some new things that have just recently happened and how that's impacted recycling uh, and makes it confusing and it almost feels like it's confusing on purpose. <laughs> uh, so... Like I said, ultimately, the best way to think of it is two separate things, uh, recycling and plastic. So the reason that I say this on top of that is like the history of recycling. So the first plastic recycling facility in the United States came into existence in 1972 in Pennsylvania. However, other recycling came way earlier than that. So aluminum recycling plants in the United States go back to 1904 in Chicago Paper recycling goes back to 1031 in Japan, um, which is like the first recorded instance recorded instance of recycling in the 1600s. Philadelphia 
Uh, they had uh, paper recycling, and that was made out of the paper was made from mills that turned old fabrics and cotton cloth, et cetera, et cetera, into recycled paper. And in the 1700s, metal recycling was a feature in New York to make bullets for the Revolutionary War. So recycling has been around for a long time in many different forms, including like the modern quote unquote industrial processing of the materials to turn them into something else. So recycling has been around for a lot longer than plastic and plastic quote recycling. Let's talk a little bit about the difference between how the term recyclable is used depending on the context. So this is like another confusing part of this whole thing is that you and I probably consider recyclable to mean that we can take an item and place it into the recycling and that it is physically, that is based upon the fact that it is physically capable of being recycled because it can be transformed into a new thing again to be used in the future. So this is one of the definitions of like recyclable, probably the one that we're all operating under the assumption of. The then we have this other thing. So this is the other and often misunderstood use of the word recyclable is in terms of the Federal Trade Commission Green Guide requirements, the FTC, for products and labeling. We're going to actually look at this because this law reveals a lot of the issues, <laughs> which is ironic because it's a law that's meant to regulate and it basically, I guess, it's just not strong enough. It's not a strong enough regulation. So the I'm going to put a link to this uh, in the description of the show notes so that you can look at it and read up on it and, and maybe like reference some of the plastics that you have around the house and check it out. So it's... Uh, Section 260.12, Recyclable Claims. So this is FTC's regulations on the claim of a product being recyclable on packaging. So, A, it is deceptive to misrepresent directly or by implication that a product or package is recyclable. A product or package should not be marketed as recyclable unless it can be collected, separated, and otherwise recovered from the waste stream through an established recycling program for use in manufacturing or assembling another item. This is what we were just kind of talking about in regards to whether an item can actually be like physically recycled. It can be reused to create a new item again. And so far, so good. The next part, B, is split into a bunch of like little subcategories. So here we go. So B, marketers should clearly and prominently qualify recyclable claims to the extent necessary to avoid deception about the availability of recycling programs and collection sites to consumers. This is the beginning of some of the stuff that you were talking about in your question about having a program where you put recyclables, quote unquote, on the curb, and then they go away. And you're, we're all operating under the root assumption that that's we're recycling. <laughs> so the first subsection of this B part, when recycling facilities are available to a substantial majority of consumers or communities where the item is sold, marketers can make unqualified recyclable claims. The term substantial majority, as used in the context that it means at least 60%, of the population of an area. So this next part, B2, discusses how you can still be allowed to call an item recyclable, even if it doesn't meet this 60% accessibility threshold. So when a recycling facility, when recycling facilities are available to less than a substantial majority of consumers or communities where the item is sold, Marketers should qualify all recyclable claims. Marketers may always qualify recyclable claims by stating the percentage of consumers or communities that have access to facilities that recycle the item. Or, alternatively, 
Marketers may use qualifications that vary in strength depending on facility availability. The lower the level of access to an appropriate facility, the more strongly the marketer should emphasize the limited availability of recycling for the product. For example, if recycling facilities are available to slightly less than a substantial majority of consumers or communities where the item is sold, a marketer may qualify a recyclable item by claiming, quote, this product or package may not be recyclable in your area, or recycling facilities for this product or package may exist in your area. End quote. If recycling facilities are available to only a few consumers, marketers should use stronger clarifications. For example, a marketer in this situation may qualify its recyclable claim by stating this product or package is recyclable only in a few communities that have the appropriate recycling facilities. Those are examples. So basically, if it's not able to be recycled by 59% of the general public due to a lack of access, you're still allowed to say that it's recyclable because technically it is. As long as you state that it may not be recyclable where you might be living. And so this is something you have to that this is something that I've seen on many items working in like the coffee industry throughout like my youth. Um, and I'm sure many other food related industries have seen uh, this type of marking on stuff. Perhaps you're just in your grocery store, you've seen markings like this on many of your items. So let's move on to the next section. C. Marketers can make unqualified recyclable claims for a product or package if the entire product or package, excluding a minor incidental component, is recyclable. For items that are partially made of recyclable components, marketers should clearly and prominently qualify the recyclable claim to avoid deception about which portions are recyclable. So basically... If your entire item is not recyclable, but it contains materials that are recyclable to like the greater whole, the details of that have to be on it someplace to not be deemed deceptive. So like the plastic liner of like a yogurt that's made of plastic, the containers made of plastic, it'll say that like the liner is not plastic, but this part is, is, is the liner is not recyclable plastic, but the container is recyclable plastic. And then there's D. So if any component significantly limits the ability to recycle the item, any recyclable claim would be deceptive. Any item that is made from recyclable material, but because of its shape, size, or some other attribute is not accepted in recycling programs should not be marketed as recyclable. So this is like if an item has materials that can't be recyclable, um, but like other components of it are. So like um, the coffee cups, let's, I'm going to go back to the coffee example. So plastic um, or so paper coffee cups rather are the interior of them is lined with plastic because paper is permeable. So coffee can't just go into like a straight paper thing. So it's lined with plastic. So the coffee cup is not recyclable because the plastic that's in the coffee cup is not recyclable. So it's not, yeah, there is no marking on most coffee cups that say that it's recyclable because it can't be, it can't say that because there's plastic liner, it can't be recycled. Okay, so that's all the details about making the claims of being recyclable in like a legally defined kind of way. So let's back it up a little bit and go back to the beginning and take a look at The initial idea of recycling as it pertains to plastics, as in, can it actually even be broken down and turned into a new thing? So plastic in our world is broken up into two major categories. There's thermoplastics and thermoset plastics. Thermoset plastics make up a quarter of all the plastics that are generated. So this is a type of plastic polymer like um, epoxy, uh, silicone, urea formaldehyde, vulcanized rubber, vinyl esters, polyurethane, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And these are the things that are like the soles of sneakers or hoses, uh, the inflatable like bouncy balls that you have at the store, tires, uh, piping, 
waterproof liners, toilet seats, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All kinds of those like really firm, hard plastics that are used for a long period of time as like a non-disposable item. So this type of plastic is, it goes through a similar process as the other kind. So it's heated up and it's shaped. Um, but once it is heated up and shaped, it creates like a super strong chemical bond between the polymer molecules. And that bond is really, really difficult to break. So these types of plastics, once they're set, they burn. If you try and like melt them down, they'll burn before they can be melted and reshaped into a new thing. Sort of like, like a log. If you burn it, it turns into like, some, it burns, it turns into something different and it can't be like reassembled. It's the same kind of concept. It, the plastic will just like burn and it's not able to be molded um, into anything else. So these plastics are not recyclable. Physically, they are not recyclable. The entire category of this because they cannot be melted down. The other 75% of plastics are thermoplastics. And these are your like your acrylics, your polystyrenes, your polythenes, your nylons, your teflons, your polypropylenes, so on and so forth. These are the plastics that we see in plastic bottles, plastic silverware, plastic bags, the coffee lids, so on and so forth. Um, these are all of the single-use plastics. Um, so these items also likely have the familiar little triangle with numbers in them on somewhere on them, or will have like a print of something similar. This design, the triangle, it's actually not it's not meant for us. <laughs> it's called the, it's a resin identifier code. Um, and it's not meant for us to know what is and is not recyclable. It's meant for recycling facilities, like pla facilities that receive plastics to be able to sort them into different categories of what type of plastic it is. Is it a polystyrene? Is it a polypropylene? Is it an acrylic? You know, that's what that's for. And the, the inference can then be made by the consumer, based on what we're told, of if this number is recyclable, if that number is recyclable. And there's a whole bunch of things that are, are in play with that because some facilities accept this number some facilities don't. And that's like a big part of this whole thing too. So the only products that are produced that have the little RIC, the resident identifier code on them that are actually recyclable all of the way are number one and number two. And these items can only be recycled successfully a few times because they'll start to degrade every time they get melted down. It degrades the plastic. And then eventually they just are waste. So they are not truly recyclable. Because depending on like what point of its life cycle it's in. Is like the quality of the plastic. And I feel like this is one of those things where if you pick a certain brand of a bottled beverage and like squeeze it in your hand and then pick another perhaps cheaper bottled beverage and squeeze it in your hand, you can feel like the difference in the quality of the plastic. Like one will be like super crumbly and feel almost like a hard bag. <laughs> and the other one will be just like your typical, um, what you would expect from like a soda bottle. So so here's where like the next big component of this like whole puzzle comes into play. So not only are the amounts of these plastics that are created mostly not recyclable because there's lots and lots of numbers and only number one and number two are universally recyclable, quote unquote. 
And those that are not truly recyclable because of the small amounts of like the life cycles that they have, um, even if they are number one and number two, it is also wildly more expensive to pay for the process of recycling plastic materials than it is to generate more plastic. So this isn't the same fact for other recycling processes and materials, but with plastic, it's more expensive to, even if it's like high quality plastic on it's like this is its first life cycle and it's with it's been perfectly sorted with all of the other number ones. So, and there's no number fives, there's no number sevens, there's none of the other stuff. It's still more expensive to do everything to that amount of plastic to reuse it than it is to just like make new plastic. Let's, that's a, that was like a bunch of stuff. <laughs> well, let's take a second to absorb all of that and like bring it all together. So we're gonna, we're gonna do like an experiment. <laughs> so we're, let's go to the fridge. Um, if you're at home, go to the fridge or when you get to wherever you're going, go to the fridge. If you're going to the grocery store, go to an aisle that has plastic stuff in it. I'm sure it won't be hard to find. Pick up like a hummus um, or just snag something out of your fridge. Um, grab three items, three, let's say, and look to see if they have the little triangle with the number on it, the little resin identifier code. What number is it? Is it number five? It probably is. <laughs> and that is not recyclable because nobody accepts it. It is technically recyclable it is physically capable of being recycled in certain circumstances but it's not recyclable <laughs> because no one takes it it also the plastic you're holding probably also has some sort of markation on it that says not recycled in all communities to legally allow it to contain it's, quote, recyclability under FTC laws. It probably has some sort of markation on it that says that it's not recycled in all communities because no one takes it. And that's because any amount less than 60% of the population doesn't have access to a way to recycle whatever that plastic is. It could be 1% of the population can recycle it. It could be 59% of the population recycle it. Like vague language being used purposefully. That's kind of like, you know, may not be recycled. Like, so there's like the whole vague language things. So the let's talk about the number five situation. So number five. So there was like a recent event that happened not too long ago in 2018, where China, who is one of the larger uh, importers of waste and like plastics from around the world, China said that they would no longer take plastic from the United States. And this is where like that comes into play uh, because this material was sent over along with a bunch of other stuff. And like we talked about that a little bit in the myths and facts about, uh, pl about recycling that like China has these rules where they're, just like flat out not accepting certain things. There's like a ton of regulations on the types of stuff that they do accept. And like this is this is one of them. So number five plastics are um, not being accepted anymore. And they used to be because they are like theoretically recyclable. But because of the way that we as individuals have been told recycling works, we throw all of our stuff into the same bin and like things like this number five, but also things like the plastic from like your thing of strawberries go into the same thing. And because we're told this recyclable, it has a triangle on it with a number, but it's not recyclable and all that stuff rather than get sorted in the United States, gets sent out of the country to be sorted, et cetera, et cetera. So like the system was set up, to rely entirely on us 
being able to like separate like more than nine different types of plastics in our homes, which is like an insane assumption, particularly since we are told that items are recyclable when they're not. So um, all these other numbers of uh, materials, uh, the number is like a different type of material, all these other materials uh, that are not recyclable have the triangle on them. It's like super misleading and deceptive and they, they can't, they can't be recycled. We throw them in and no one sorts them. They get shipped over to China. China gets pissed off because they're like, all this stuff is unsorted, but that's part of the problem, but not the entirety of the problem. The actual issue with contamination, um, the actual issue is contamination amongst the unsorted situation the big issue is contamination and it's not like we've been told contamination because of like you didn't um like liquefy and wash off every atom of you know like tomato sauce off of the inside of like the can it's or like the plastic jar it's it's because all of this stuff gets sent over, this plastic and everything gets sent over in these shipping containers that also contain the, quote, recyclable, end quote, um, industrial byproducts of processes like smelting iron and, like, making textiles. So all this stuff is, like, lumped together and sent over to China in these big shipping containers and they get it and they're like, you don't sort your plastic and you are sending your plastic, even if it is recyclable over with all this other shit, <laughs> that's like, that should be separate. Like you should have separated your iron and your steel from smelting from this like unsorted amount of plastic. So the amount of work that goes into recycling or like to separate all that we don't do. And China was doing until now they're like, actually we're not doing that anymore because you're sending over materials that are not recyclable. And so like this back to the number five, this number five is part of that group of plastics that is technically recyclable because you can break it down and turn it back into another item a few times before it becomes like degraded and then it's gone. So it can be recycled for like a few times. It can have like a more than a one, one life. Um, but it's mixed in with number seven, number three, number four, all these other materials that are made of plastic that have the little symbol on the bottom that are not recyclable because we're told to just throw everything in the plat in, in, the recycling. So we do. So like ultimately all of that stuff with like the number five, all of these things is that like essentially it, it doesn't have anything to do with us. Like why the system, ha like the system was broken before and now it's just broken like way even more than it was before, which is why there's like new, newer information that's like coming out about the, the, the new layer of flaws on top of the idea of plastic recycling. <laughs> because, like, ultimately, it doesn't have anything to do with you and me. And it has everything to do with the fact that, like, America is not investing in creating infrastructure that allows for, like, successful recycling of plastics that are recyclable, even if only for a short period of time. And then there's the whole, like, it's not, it's indefinite. It costs more to, to do that than just to make new ones. And the infrastructure to make new ones is there and doing just fine. So like it's the whole system is not set up for recycling of plastics to be successful. And like, I, I would love to hear from somebody who selected an item from their fridge that meets all the criteria <laughs> <laughs> for um, labeling and for like what it like what it is that indicates that the item in their hand is made of plastic and is recyclable to more than 60% of the country and that the facility also accepts that material and that actually processing that material 
is fiscally beneficial than just it getting received by a place to just throw it away because there's no profitability in recycling that material. Like, I would love to see that happen just like on a a luck of the draw. But this is where like a lot of the statistics about recycling, these new newer statistics about recycling with like the the super, super low recycle, the recycle, recycle rates of plastics when it compares to other materials, it's like so much lower. So like the recycling rate for plastic in the United States is 8.7%, uh, according to like the EPA, who part of how all this works is, is like every facility has to like document all of the stuff that they get coming in and they have to submit it all to like the EPA. So there's also the honor system. So this is just what everyone says. <laughs> Um, but according to the EPA and all their reporting, the recycling rate for plastic is 8.7% compared to others that are like in the 20s, 60s, 90% um, recycling rate. And this is due to all the stuff that we talked about that like most plastic is created that physically cannot be recycled. It will never be able to be recycled into a new thing, but it's a part of the plastic that's created and a part of the plastic that gets sent to facilities, including including like just trash. And then there's all the materials that like could theoretically technically be recycled and they get brought to a facility amongst uh, a whole bunch of other stuff that's the non-recyclable plastics. So it's too much work to go through it all. So it just ends up in the garbage, but it's, you know, a part of all the plastic that's coming in. And then that also includes the plastic that is actually successfully recycled the 8.7 percent so it's 35.7 million tons of plastic is generated just in the united states every single year and only the smallest portion of that is actually recycled because it's recyclable and this is just like teach it's cheaper to burn it and like make energy or just like throw it away so like ultimately you know i like this is like a lot of just information, but you know, like plastic is plastic because it has all this crazy bullshit that comes along with it. And recycling is recycling because you can do it. (laughs) And it has all the things in place because it's an old -er system. Um, So like the flack that recycling gets as a whole is sad because I think that ultimately it's going to affect and that it does affect the recycling rates of all these other materials like paper, the largest portion or the largest category of material that goes to landfills in the United States is paper, even though it is the highest recycling rate. It is also the highest quantity of material in landfills that decomposes anaerobically and creates methane gas that contributes to climate change. So like messing with that and like having this kind of like all recycling is a, is a myth thing is a bad idea. Um, because the more that it impacts the successful recycling rates, like cardboard's recycling rates, like 90%. And then, um, like other papers are 60 in the sixties and then, um, like food related paper and like paper packaging, um, related to food is like in the twenties and like all of that can be better and like can't afford to get worse. And then there's the whole, like, um, like a glass and aluminum. They're, they're both infinitely recyclable. The processes, in order to do those things are like in place and are not more expensive than like mining for new like metal <laughs> or um, making use of the already like significantly diminished supply of um, like silicas to make new glass. And so like those things getting into the waste stream and going to landfills or the ocean or wherever other than to like recycling facilities is really, really bad. Um, and like, we can't, we don't live in a world that has the luxury of having those things get worse. So like plastic is plastic. 
recycling is recycling. Plastic is not recycling. And that ultimately, well, the, the, the truth is we need to stop producing plastic. <laughs> so, and like that's a very big thing. That's like a much bigger issue beyond like our control uh, as individuals on our personal like at home level. Um, but there's all these other things that we have the ability to do as individuals. And that includes like advocating for this, like the ceasing of the production of plastics or like strictly regulating the production of plastics, you know, and to accept small wins rather than shit on them. (laughs) Because that's like another big component of, you know, like I'm a big proponent of rejecting doomerism. Like we do not accept doomerism. We value the work that tons of people are doing every single day on solving all these like tremendous environmental issues that have made significant headway and have had tremendous beneficial impacts on modern society and what's going to what the world is going to look like and be shaped like in the future. So like we we reject doomerism and so when we have small wins that push us in the correct direction, we don't shit on those. We celebrate those. So like to get back to your question about like what do I what do I do? Um the best truthfully the best thing to do is to absolutely recycle. Recycle materials that are recyclable. So aluminum cardboard, glass, paper, if it's possible, and this is like a a separate thing to incorporate like a composting situation, um, for a lot of reasons and like food scraps and stuff like that is like fine, but that's a whole other thing. But for the purpose of like paper, um, at its like final life cycle or when it's contaminated with like food that can be, um, composted depending on whether or not it's lined with plastic. Uh, but you know, that's part of, part of this whole thing. Um, like incorporating, if you can composting, at least with papers, um, into your like routine. And then like when it comes to plastic, the whole like reduce, reuse, recycle things. So like reducing the, amount of plastics, like single use plastics that you're incorporating into your routine. So reuse, like substituting some sort of reusable thing into the place of that plastic. So a good example of this would be like, um, like using bars of soap as opposed to plastic bottles of body wash or using like shampoo bars instead of plastic bottles of shampoo or using um, using those things that come in bottles from companies that use it infinitely recyclable materials like aluminum. I know that I've, I've mentioned this once before, Jonathan Van Ness, his um, hair care line uses all like aluminums and doesn't use any plastics. And, you know, that is a win. That's like a tremendous, it's an infinitely recyclable item. You can put that in your actual recycling and that's, that's a win. Um, converting from like throwaway coffee cups to a reusable thing. Like it's one of those, that's like a really, really good example of like, it seems like such a small thing because it's just like one coffee cup, but one coffee cup per work day, per human for the average amount of like the, the working year than like the days that you go into work. It's like times the amount of working people there are like the, the scale of of, like the, like single use, like plastic cups um, and like paper cups that are not recyclable are like, it's tremendous. It's a huge, like think of just, just think of like the big Starbucks, McDonald's, 
Burger King, all those like companies um, that have like these huge grinding machines that pump out single use plastics like lids, um, the cups that are lined with plastic, et cetera, et cetera. Like substituting a reusable thing into like into that part of like your routine and also like demanding the diminishing of like the reliance on single use plastics in like every single component of our society. <laughs> like there is no reason for there to be a single use plastic for literally everything. I understand the convenience, but like nothing is worth that level of convenience considering how much evidence we have already about how bad like microplastics are and how bad plastic is and how bad it's going to get if nothing changes. Like it's pretty crazy. So um, ultimately like the best things to do is, is just like eliminating plastic, single use plastics from your routines where you can and like amping up your efforts at home of recycling the actual recyclable materials that have a recyclable program. And yeah, so like before I beat a dead horse with this microphone over and over and over again, um, that's the best way to think about it is yes, plastic recycling is 100% a myth. It is not real. It is not successful. It was never meant to be successful. Most of the time, the material can't physically even be broken down and turned into something successfully. So it's not recyclable, even though these like regulatory um, regulations <laughs> um, that are meant to prohibit something actually just kind of like open up the, you know, it's just like the minimum wage thing to be like minimum wage essentially becomes the, the standard of like, this is, you know, where we're our starting point. So like all these other like numbers and stuff are just like the start is like the goal for a lot of these places to be able to state a thing that's not true because huge portions of like the population don't have access to it, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. So like, just like we need to give up on plastics and like pivot back into actual recyclable materials and like reusing things. Like why have a single use everything? You are correct in saying that the recycling of plastic is, is not real because it's not nobody, even if it is real, like on a mechanical level, nobody's taking them anymore because of all the not recyclable plastic that's mixed into it and all the other like pollution that we like toss in with it when we ship it over to other places out of sight, out of mind at like an institutional level, not like an individual level. So yeah, I hope that that answers your question. I hope I didn't beat this to death, even though I feel compelled to beat this to death because of how I feel about plastic. So Thank you for calling in. I would love to like get even more specific about some of this stuff and like have a deep dive into like a very particular process or a very particular like number of plastic and like go into the whole thing. That would be super cool. I'd be very into kind of getting into a very specific world like that. And in the meantime, thank you so much for calling in. Thank you for engaging with the show by calling in, by listening, by subscribing, by following all of those wonderful things. It, it means a lot. It has like a tremendous impact on its, on the show's reach, the overall goal of this show of like sharing good news about environmental progress, um, demystifying things, making information more accessible and planting trees, reforestation. And that's part of this whole project is uh, reforestation. Every episode that gets posted because somebody calls in or otherwise uh, results in the planting of a tree. So thank you, sir, for planting a tree because you called in. And each sale from my web store online also will plant a tree. A portion of the proceeds from um, this episode for each episode goes into planting even more trees as part of like a reforestation project in Appalachia and other national parks that have experienced some deforestation historically, particularly due to some rollbacks that happened in 2018 by we all know who. Um, 
but also around the world, other places that I have reforestation going on. You can go on my website and let, check out like who the organizations that I work with are and learn a little bit more about them and where this goes. Patreon, another way to support plants a tree every month, keeps the lights on, keeps me able to do this, which is fun. And so, yeah. So until next time, thank you so much for tuning in. Bye. <laughs>